Okay, today we're talking about the history of landscape. And it's not all history, but I do think history is a big part of it. Uh, and it's something really important given where we live in the West and the kind of rich history of landscape painting. And uh, the majority of what we see when we go to a gallery or something like that around town or really um, in, the, in the American West. So first, just kind of want to ask the, the question, what is a landscape? Uh, if we were in class, I think that one of the answers that might come up would be like, kind of like a, a, like a window into something. And that, that time and time again, that there's kind of this rectangular notion um, of, of a landscape in art and then uh, in you know just in in life a landscape is something um, outside it's the earth so um, the, I just kind of want to go back to a definition here as I like to do the the term landscape actually derives from a Dutch word landscape which originally meant a region tract of land, but acquired the artistic connotation of picture depicting scenery or land in the early 1500s. So it's, you know, we see landscape paintings, right? So, so um, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through these really quickly because we do have a lot to color, cover. Um, but first, uh, in art, landscape was a setting, right? Here's the Mona Lisa, right? Arguably one of the most famous pieces in the world. And there we have the landscape in the background. It's something almost forgettable, right? Um, art historians will look at uh, pieces from this time period and study the, the background to see, you know, who the assistants were, because the artist actually never painted the landscape, wouldn't be bothered by painting something so benign as, as that. And so we just have landscape as setting, all right? It's the background to the subject to what the artist is trying to talk about. Okay, so just a few of those. And then we have landscape as subject. All right, so this is the first time um, where the, there's a shift in our, in our history and, and the, the landscape actually became, becomes the subject of the piece, right? Um, so landscape painting were usually idealized. They're presented as a pastoral idea. Um, this ideal is drawn from the classical literature. Most artists depicted the forest, uh, the forested Italian hills, even if they had never been to Italy, which is, the, I think this is just fascinating. Uh, and formulas for creating landscape paintings uh, that sold became common. So landscape was still just a formula, right? It may be the subject, but it's pastoral ideal drawn from literature. And uh, it's not, it doesn't even maybe exist, right? But it's, it's a formula on uh, Italian hills. And these formulas were created using spe specific elements, um, like a, an object along the edge of uh, a composition that directs the viewer's eye in, into the piece. And these are still used today in both painting and photography. And you'll see in some of these pieces how we just have something kind of on the edge and it, and it kind of draws you in. And there's a few there's a few ways into this piece. We'll kind of look at that sailboat and diagonally up into that windmill. So we'll kind of come in from the corner. So we'll just go right to that the big windmill. Um, but uh, this is a, this is a pretty uh, um, famous piece in, in the Netherlands. They just loved painting their windmills. Um, <laughs> and kind of this nice road leading in here. So um, we kind of see this as being a real uh, movement. And, and I, I don't know, I, maybe it's because my like lineage comes from the Netherlands, but I just really do love these pieces. This piece, um, and yeah, another one where the windmills start fading to the background. There's something else kind of, we're moving towards something else. There's a lot of movement in the trees here as well as the clouds, right? Um, so you can kind of feel it in a different way. But um, and kind of the last last area that we're going to look at is the classical landscape. Um, in the 17th century, the classical landscape was born, and these landscapes were influenced by uh, antiquity, and they sought to illustrate the ideal landscape, recalling Arcadia, a legendary place in ancient Greece known for its quiet pastoral beauty. And don't lose sight of this pastoral beauty as we move forward um, in history here in, in the lecture. Um, the Roman poet Virgil had described Arcadia as the home of pastoral simplicity. 
I mean, you can't get it. Doesn't that just sound like where you want to kind of live out your days? In, in a classical landscape, the positioning of objects was contrived. Every tree, rock, or animal was carefully placed to present a harmonious, balanced, and timeless mood. That's really important for these pieces. Right? So these, are, these places don't exist at all. You'll see storm clouds, but they're never threatening. Right? Um, it, it's just everything is perfect, and it's this pastoral kind of um, ideal. Right, so uh, just a kind of a couple of these as well. It's, I mean, who would not want to live off that land, right? It looks like everything you need: plenty of water, livestock, um, no e ecological degradation around. Right, it's just uh, it's all good. Um, and so the uh, landscape was not really accepted in the academy up to this point. And in the late 18th century, um, this really changed um, when landscape painting in France became a thing. And it, it's all because of publishing of a book, right? And we saw it in some of the, some of the other uh, movements like Dada's Realism, it was all about the, sort of the, the manifestos, right? Kind of publishing things for really getting around. Um, and with the publishing of this book, uh, the, uh, the book emphasized the aesthetic ideal for the historic landscape, which must be based on the study of real nature. All right, that's really important. The success of the book pushed the Academy to create the prize for historic landscape in 1817. Um, so it's a while ago, but not, you know, not that long ago, really, when you think about the history of art for the landscape and, and how much landscapes we have today. Um, for it not to be taken seriously until 1817, I think is uh, pretty significant. Um, and we start to, we see rain, look at that. Um, so this is a little early, but we're still kind of, we're moving into that. Um, so, but this piece right here, I think is really where the tide starts to turn. It feels different, right? Everything's not totally clean. We can see that it's actually painted at this point. And there's kind of this foggy mood to the piece. And uh, I think it, it really does a good job kind of showing this transition that we have into Impressionism. Um, so Impressionism developed in France in the 19th century is based on the practice of painting outdoors and spontaneously on the spot rather than in the studio from sketches. So main Impressionist subjects were landscapes and scenes of everyday life, all right? This is kind of plain there. They want to really capture that moment and we really start to feel, we can see the paint now, right? Um, the passing, the fleeting moment of time. Monet, of course, being one of the big dogs of the of the time period, right? We've seen this one a couple of times, and it's just kind of a great contrast. The way the color really is just kind of working um, with each other here, and the simple brush strokes of the sun kind of reflecting off the water, and um, yeah, just one of the one of the staples, right? Or to use our term, the canon, right? This one's clearly in the canon. And we have a little more, uh, you know, a little more realism to this, but we still see kind of this uh, kind of soft softness in the handling of the paint. We can see that the, the time of day is, is moving in some way. Those sailboats are gonna be off the page soon. Right? And then we have Van Gogh. I usually thought of as more of a post-impressionist. Um, maybe not always painting out in the field or, you know, not so concerned with that fleeting moment per se, but the brush strokes are um, clearly kind of inspired from the impressionist movement. And uh, there's no one, it's no wonder he's a favorite, right? So this kind of moves us into the sublime and the pristine unoccupied landscapes. All right. Um, please kind of pay close attention to this. It's pretty short. Um, and she'll talk about those the kind of pastoral moments and also really um, key into the memento mori. All right, I really want us to, to come away with that. American landscape painting acquired an extraordinary resonance in the 19th century. Recognizable American scenery, but conceived on the models um, that had long been established in European painting that signified um, particularly 
two basic responses. There was the wilderness, which evoked the sublime, excitement, agitation, uh, wonder, and then the beautiful, which signals a landscape that has been cultivated by uh, the hand of man to be a hospitable setting. They're, in a way, they're cliches, but there's a lot of truth in them when you begin to unpack them. By the 1830s, um, the wilderness was rapidly being um, claimed, cultured, cultivated, developed. And there's always this push and pull in the American psyche between a belief in progress and a reverence for the sanctity of the so-called wilderness. But landscapes tell stories. They tell it through weather, through the time of day. Can you walk into the painting easily? Um, or are you obstructed? You know, would you have to sort of clear the way? And one of the great iconographies um, that shows the hand of man beginning to operate is an ax cut stump. Um, it's unmistakable. And it's what I call a memento mori. It, this is what was forfeited in order that you could have this vista. I mean, there is a, a beauty and a harmony and a finish to these paintings that makes them very attractive, but it just takes a couple of visual cues to, um, uh, to initiate a deeper understanding of the moment and the historical's mindset. And one of the reasons I think also that um, landscape was seen as so powerful in the United States is that it implies a collective ownership. It's like Cole's admonition, whether it's the banks of the Hudson or the banks of the Oregon, this is your country. But looking at these landscapes, it conceives of Americans as a unified set of political understandings. It conferred upon what was in fact a very contentious and fragile union of interests. Um, it implied that it was a nation. It is, you know, sort of the, the great song, our, you know, this land is your land, this land is my land. I mean, it's sung visually in a way um, uh, in these paintings, but some of the complexities, some of the the tensions and some of the darker sides of this kind of, um, of movement are still acknowledged here and there. And these paintings are to be sure, they are an ideal vision, um, but it's, they're very convincing. And they reflect a set of beliefs that are still current um, today. All right, so there's a couple of things there. I think over you know, the momentum more definitely, uh, but uh, the the collective ownership I think really speaks to kind of the ideology um, of the United States and just kind of the way that we view land ownership, right? Um, and there was one more that I'm forgetting, so I'll spare you. Um, but I, ho I hope you're listening. Right. So this is one of the more, most famous um kind of pieces of this time in the of the Hudson River School and Thomas Cole is a uh, real a big name and we saw this just kind of in the elements of principles lectures as well just as far as how we how we kind of have a sense of balance here from left to right um, even though you know we have kind of a strong foreground and a really dark background on the left and but we have like a sense of implied vastness there on the right atmospheric perspective etc um but I, I do want to bring up the atmospheric perspective point uh, in these pieces because it's uh, very strong, um, right? So things in the background uh, appear to have less detail than things in the foreground, and therefore we can kind of tell that they're far away. We really have a um, strong notion of sublime as well. Um, the, the idea of the sublime um, sun kind of always coming in really strong overhead and these really just... Um, larger than life landscapes, um, just inspiring awe. And, um, you know, there's the United States has a, a, you know, strong connection with Christianity and, and, you know, painters are really kind of um, equating these, these skyscapes and these pieces as something like of the heavens as well. And how kind of untouchable these landscapes were um, and almost separate from ourselves that, you know, they're greater and, um, you know, much like, you know, some people um, see um, 
see scripture and um in christ and so there's um there's kind of these these interesting parallels that happen here in, in comparison to kind of the pastoral beauty was is that the hand of man and the cultivated um and kind of the comfortable place to be right um so just for a little contrast there um and we have a few more we're going to see a couple more um artists here later in the lecture that use this uh use this style uh to but in the in the cont contemporary context, right. so not to go too far from these, but it is a pretty um, significant American movement in painting. Uh, Thomas Moran is someone I, I just want to tell a little story about. He was on early explorations of the West with um, where they're kind of even just seeing what was out here, and this is how you know artists like uh, Moran were the ones who showed people what was on the west coast and this piece right here inspired congressional representatives to create uh, yellowstone national park all right so this is kind of this this fascinating thing that uh you know uh, it was it was the artists of the time that were really helping kind of sway public opinion and, and this isn't free of of critique right i'm not trying to be like wow art is the greatest thing ever uh, although I do think it is one of the greatest things ever, I do think that we still need to be very critical of it. Um, these were kind of, like she said, these were ideals. I think that was the other point I wanted to bring up. These, for sure, these are ideal landscapes. And what do they do? Um, but they, they picture the West as being some sort of pristine, unoccupied territory, when in reality there were m probably millions of Native Americans out here, right? Um, and that's something that was totally glossed over in order to kind of, you know, fulfill the manifest destiny of this being coast to coast nation. Um, and I just kind of want to show you this watershed map that um, John Wesley Powell drew for Congress. Uh, this was the exploration in the scientist that Thomas Moran was with. Um, and, and at the time, Wesley Powell said, you know, this is the, this is the arid region and it cannot be settled the way it is on the East Coast. Um, but there's a whole new series of challenges uh, here, and we need to be very careful. And congressional representatives said, you know, these new fledged scientists don't understand the practical problems of managing public lands. Um, and so, you know, we have the uh, the Four Corners region, and they just kind of laid a laid a grid over the Western United States. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there's just always been a little bit of a resistance to the science here, um, right? And uh, so this is just kind of the little bit of background that I just gave you. If you want to take a look, go ahead and pause it and uh, read through that. It's fascinating. And this is uh, the type of boats that they were on for this, for, for the trip. And some of the, some of the drawings that came back. So... Here's Thomas Miranda, Young Paiute here, and then um, Colbert, another explorer. And Cliffs of the Green River. So, you know, they, they went all the way down the Green River, down the Colorado. Um, Green River meets the Colorado River, um, down around kind of uh, Moab-ish area. Um, and so now we're kind of moving into the Southwest here. So this, these two painters were traveling from the East to the West. And um, the, their story is really significant to Western landscape painting. And the story goes that um, these two artists you know, landed in Taos this is, uh, on a um, sunny fall day in 1898. And it just so happened that uh, a broken wagon wheel was what made them stop. So their, their wheel and their horse-drawn carriage um, was was on its way to Mexico and so they had to stop here to get their wheel repaired and the, these two artists became so enchanted with the lighting in northern New Mexico and the rich cultural history um, that they stayed and word then spread to Paris, New York, St. Louis and artists began visiting Taos and if you've ever been to northern New Mexico you kind of you know what I'm talking about you know what they're talking about the lighting the sunsets are just unreal and um, Maybe not so much in Taos anymore. It's kind of turned into a tourist thing. Um, but uh, a lot of northern New Mexico is still, it's, it is very, it's very rich culturally. And um, the people are uh, contagious. You just, you want to stay. Um, so this broken wagon wheel really changed 
art history um, forever in some ways. And um, so we just have another, another work by, by there. And the, this kind of imagery was just, um, people couldn't imagine it, right? You know, maybe we've grown up seeing it, seen, a, seen some of it, seen a lot of it, um, wherever, but this is, it's, it's unbelievable to people, right? So we start having artists, you know, flocking to the West just to be artists, right? Um, to capture the lighting, to capture the, um, the spirit of the West and exploration. Um, and then, you know, depicting uh, both Anglo explorers and um, the natives of, of the area. And, and again, you know, oftentimes still in very like kind of idealized or romanticized um, ways. Three generations, kind of a nice piece as well. And the wagon boss, right? And then of course, Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, if you're ever down in Santa Fe and you're looking to go to the Smart Museum, she's got a great uh, great museum there that's it's definitely worth uh, the few bucks to get in. Next door, there used to be a really great um, photo gallery with all kinds of uh, Ansel Adams. I understand now that's in Jackson Hole. So if you're in Jackson Hole, you can probably Google like Ansel Adams photography and find that, uh, find that gallery. Um, it's hard to believe that Ski Town, well, it's not so hard, but um, Ski Towns, you know, have more money than a uh, place where people are looking to collect art. So how the world shifts. Um, but she was really kind of interested in capturing the feeling of a place, right? And, and Northern New Mexico really changed her painting style as well. As she's really looking at capturing uh, what she felt from the landscape and how she could, um, you know, handle that in paint. Yeah. Absolutely iconic artist. And right around the same time, we have Ken Price too, who is, um, I really just kind of throw him because of that, that Northern New Mexico influence. And you can tell inspired by George O'Keefe, but definitely nothing like it. But we also have these moments where the, the kind of um, man-made structure is really starting to sneak in, right? Become a subject of the pieces in their own right. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll touch back on that. And we also have Ansel Adams, okay? You know, we all have probably heard this name, loved his photos, um, and really credited with I know we're moving back in time just a little bit here, but with the preservation of Yosemite, right? And um, he was fortunate, maybe we are too, that he was from a wealthy family and he was able to kind of take and have photos during the, um, the Great Depression. And, uh, and But it, it was a, a way that uh, we're able to see these spaces in time that people usually weren't. And Carlton Watkins, is, Watkins sorry, was um, someone that was right there along his side. Um, documenting the wonders of the West, right? and and not so much just in terms of painting now, but um, in photos as well. Um, but I want to take us to one more, just kind of since we're talking about photography, an image that helped kind of um, shift the way that the public looks at the world um, in Earthrise Apollo Eight and the Blue Marble, um, and so. This image right here was, is thought to have spurred the um, development of Earth Day, right? Uh, so it's uh, just a curious thing because not many people really know any of the experiments that NASA carried out, but the um, way that we were able to look back at the world then has some sort of shift in the responsibility that we feel um, that we have for it. Um, so I just kind of want to point that out as we look um, it's kind of, we kind of move forward in, in the semester, we'll start to see artists who are thinking about um, solutions, right? So just depicting something that's beautiful. Um, and the new topographics, um, this was a real turning point in photography. So this is a 1975 exhibition that um, started to show pictures of the, of the landscape with uh, suburban sprawl and everyday scenes that we don't usually give a second glance, right? So the trans transcendental kind of natural vistas, um, the romantic views, 
were not really their concern. They were more interested in kind of showing, um, you know, our influence on the landscape, right? Uh, and, all, and a few of these artists were actually here in, in Colorado. So I believe this is a Jefferson County photograph. This is pretty close to the South Park area. And I think this one's Pacific Northwest somewhere, logging. All right, concrete blocks, escape ladders, just this is the landscape that we have created right, that we live in, um, agricultural, right, urban, um, it, and everything in between, like, it, it's such a, they seem so kind of dull, but, but yeah, this is, um, these are the lives, and this is the society, and the world, and the landscape that we're creating, and they're really interested in documenting that. This is was really fascinating with the grid, right, um, it's almost like a, a street map or something, right? Many mapping, mapping practices rely on the grid. And taking photos of these um, kind of these areas that may be also ways of life that are, might also be kind of disappearing and how that, what that looks like as it decays. And so um, it, it's still an influence on photography today, right? Um, we see a lot of people documenting uh, agricultural fields, um, places that maybe seem out of place, right? Like a golf course in the middle of the desert, probably shouldn't be there. Um, uh, but uh, really kind of beautiful wild photographs, right? In the mining industry, something that we all rely on, um, but taking kind of a closer look and also an aesthetic look at it, right? J. Henry Fair Industrial Scars. He's someone's really good at taking an aesthetic look at these um, otherwise, just, you know, environmentally horrifying uh, kind of ha happenings in some way. And also the the sheer magnitude and scale and and what we've accomplished to make our lives possible. Um, land scans, this is, um, just real quick. These are a series of works. This is the largest open pit mine in the world. I apologize, this is the largest open pit mine in the country. I believe the largest one's now in Russia. But each one of these pieces are pairing a sound with uh, a landscape that is something that is man-made, right? Um, and very significant to our functioning in the world. Grapevine, California, to um, Salt Lake, to Evaporates in, in Utah, to um, Harbor Steel in Indiana. All right. So if uh, you're interested in this, take a look at the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Uh, they have a lot of really interesting artwork that uh, they're kind of, kind of landscapes, kind of earth art, kind of contemporary art, a little bit of, of everything in some crazy way. They're really interesting. Um, organization. Mary Iverson is a contemporary, so we looked at it a couple of times, but we got to take one more look at it, at her, because of the way that she's using 
the um, sublime and the kind of history painting, as, as, I'll, as I'll mention it, and as you'll hear other artists talk about it, to kind of enhance her own work, right? So she has these untouched vistas, right? Uh, and then she's got the the perspective lines and the vanishing points um, and these kind of rigid lines interrupting our view of the places. Uh, and the squares is all being a metaphor for our shipping practices, right? So, um, in an otherwise pristine, unoccupied, untouched landscape, she's kind of um, begging to differ, right? as her work kind of interrupts our view on that space. Kent Monkman, uh, this is the piece that we're gonna hear him talk about in just a moment, so I'm gonna skip over it. But he does a really good job of engaging with history painting himself, the native man who um, is kind of looking at different ways that the landscape's been presented through history. And just another really, uh, a couple more great ones, kind of using the the same style that Mary Iverson is harping back on the past with contemporary uh, context, right? So we're just going to listen to him talk about a little bit about this commission at the Met for a moment. <laughs> My name's Kent Muckman. I'm a Cree artist. This is a very exciting opportunity to work with a collection of the Met because at this point in history, the Met is opening their doors to artists from different ethnicities and perspectives to be able to reflect, at least as an Indigenous person, what this colonial history has meant to us as an artist. I wanted to bring Indigenous experience into this canon of art history. My inspiration comes from a variety of different sources. I'll be looking at old paintings, I'll be thinking about contemporary experiences. I love the language of painting. How does a painter describe grief? How does a painter describe ecstasy? How do they describe human emotion? I really believe in the power of painting. And through the collaboration with my assistants, we developed a process to create compositions. From the initial pencil sketch, we start to identify who the characters are. We then moved into a photography stage. We brought models in and created a photo shoot. We then moved to canvas. And then eventually, it's just me left on the canvas by myself. That's when I really pull everything all together. And something that I've been looking at in my art practice for many years are the paintings or sculptures made by the settler artists who were looking at Indigenous people. And it's always this romantic view of the vanishing race. In fact, we're very much alive. My work really is refuting those themes of disappearance. There's elements of camp in my work. There's elements of Indigenous history When I created Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, I wanted an artistic persona that could travel through time to reverse the gaze and look back at European settlers that could really speak to create values. We had our own ideas of gender and sexuality that didn't fit the male-female binary. Miss Chief is a legendary being. She really embodies a sense of humor, a playfulness, a relationship to mythologies and history we have a lot of humor in our stories and Miss Chief allows me to bring the humor even through some very dark chapters of our experience. Looking at the Emmanuel Leutze painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware, he's the hero of that painting and I wanted Miss Chief to be the hero of my two paintings. I wanted to make a monumental painting that really reflected on Indigenous perspective to give it that same importance. The title of this exhibition is Mistigoswak, the wooden boat people, which is a Cree word to describe when the French arrived, they arrived in wooden boats. The two paintings together really speak about the arrivals and migrations and displacements of people around the world. And the Great Hall is this place of people entering and people leaving. The left painting, 
welcoming the newcomers. The mischief is literally bending over to assist people arriving to North America. That has to do with generosity. In the second painting, Resurgence of the People, Mischief is commanding this boat, which looks a lot like a, a migrant vessel. And many people across the world are being displaced from their own lands. Mischief is leading this resurgence of the people to represent a return to our languages and a return to our traditions. I love the capacity for painting to tell a story. I've always been drawn to history painting because so many indigenous experiences were never portrayed. This was an opportunity to engage with this master narrative, to reflect on it, and to offer perspectives that come from the outside. So Ken Monkman is top of the game right now. Um, and I'm sorry, just one second. He's at the top of his game right now. That's what I, what I meant to say. And um, this was just done right just la last year, uh, the time of this recording, in, in 2019. Um, and so he's a contemporary artist that's really speaking to um, the history of this country and the future of it as well, looking forward, as he, as he kind of said. Uh, so, you know, not that life's all about Instagram, but I always like it when you guys add another their artist to your Instagram feed. And I think Ken Monkman is um, a great one uh, to do it. And this, uh, I think the work that I showed was pretty, pretty tame. Um, some of it gets a little racy, some of it gets really comical. Um, and uh, there's certainly a sense of humor um, in his work, even though it is, um, you know, pretty heady and well thought out. Um, so just moving on. Um, this is an artist we're not going to spend a lot of time on because I just added, um, Kent and uh, I think his work is just better, frankly. Um, but uh, she does a really good job of layering the landscape. And the way that she goes about these is that the background itself is uh, a, uh, a moment that's really important either in the news or in the history. And then she kind of um, goes into a Photoshop and removes a lot of that information and then does some of these like abstract drawing paintings over the top. Um, and I think that she would be a great person to uh, take a look at if you're interested in doing some sort of um, layered landscape. Her process is fascinating, but in some ways her process might be better um, than the work, right? It's one of those things you got to kind of look into a little bit to get um, more out of. So, um, but I do think that uh, you should definitely, definitely take a look at what she's doing. Eric Lopresi is an artist who is really fascinated with uh, nuclear bomb testing and he does these paint paintings of the un so in Nevada they test their nuclear uh, we I guess we test our nuclear weapons underground and you get these crazy craters that you can see from Google Earth check it out um, but he paints them and he paints them and he and the only color that he uses um, is inspired by the wildflowers of the area I think there's something kind of beautiful about that because um, when we think when some of these explosions, they have like kind of some really crazy colors, but they're um, they're also kind of taking the life away from a place, um, and then the the colors kind of rep, kind of reference maybe what what's been lost in in the in the wake of that explosion. So another another kind of fascinating artist. Um, and kind of the way that he looks at the landscape. Eve Mosher is, uh, and our, this is, now we're starting to get into some pretty abstract landscape work. But she is involved, or this project was involved with the Canary Project, which is a really interesting um, project done out of, I believe, Syracuse University. Um, definitely worth taking a look at if you like kind of environmental um, art stuff. And she mapped out um, the high water line for New York and what, uh, we're going to lose as the sea level rises. And she went through with uh, the, um, what do you call those in baseball? The chalk lines. There we go. So she drew chalk everywhere that is going to flood, right? Right across the street right? and then even through the building. So kind of a funny take on it, temporary, um, but definitely engaging the public to think about how the, our landscapes are going to be changing. Um, right now in the face of, of climate change. 
this is another Venice Biennale piece that um, we've had a couple of Biennale pieces in the pursuit of Venus. And we're just going to watch a quick uh, excerpt of it. But what's important is that each the screen, you can almost see a natural line right there, um, just beyond the, the figure. Um, but uh, there's like five different projectors here, and they're all looping at different time sequence. So each one of the scenes never lines up. So you never actually see the same thing twice. And she's thinking about kind of um, history and how we tell how, how we tell our stories. There's also some some undertones of colonialism here as well, right? We can see pretty clearly in the red coats there on the right hand side of the screen. Um, another artist that would be good to look into, uh, and a little fun fact, just real quick. She didn't even want to even submit her work to the Venice Biennale because she didn't think she had a chance. Um, and it's since been one of the more influential video pieces in, in the past five years and will definitely be one of the most influential of the decade. Um, so just kind of, you know, when you doubt yourself, do it anyway, right? Uh, the little frost going south. So this is an artist who really starts to look at the landscape as a body. Um, so she kind of says that if our world uh, geographically and metaphorically uh, were to be seen as embodied as like a three-dimensional vertical figure, um, we would kind of think about the map uh, as having feet in the south, right? Um, and the, in the northern as the head, and we have like the midsection of the equator. Um, and we, and, but she also says like in this, the skirt of the world, in this term, uh, it's marked as female. And she finds that really fascinating. Um, so that's the title of the project is going south. It's in the colloquial um, kind of transit trans ugh, I'm sorry transgression of sexuality. Um, and she's really kind of um, questioning that and, and exploring that through painting these landscapes that aren't quite um, you know anything that we might recognize normally, right? So she's just looking at the process um, of hierarchy and um, division uh, through her painting practice. So Trevor Paglin uh, is a personal favorite. Uh, so we're just gonna have to watch just, just a real short video from him as well. But he's really interested in um, landscape photography um, and very inspired by the new topographics. Um, but it, it's, it's all of our influence on the world. But more than that, it's our uns what we don't see in the world but that affects us okay so place the surveillance of this is the other night sky these are all uh, you know usually we see this as being uh, stars right these ones are all satellites so kind of wild all right nsa tapped uh, tapped fiber optic cable launching site a landing site sorry this is in florida it's a beach underneath this beach is a choke point um, where all, all of our fiber optic cables for the internet come together and that's where the NSA taps into the internet to monitor use. Um, and there's just people enjoying the beach here, right? Um, but uh, it is a major source of um, kind of cyber, what they call cybersecurity, right? 
Um, and there's a really good video on this of him scuba diving down to the bottom and like taking images of these fiber optic cables on the bottom of the sea. It's crazy. So if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, take a look. Just Google Trevor Paglin, the Craters Project, or um, take a look at it on the, on the website. We're going to watch this one because it's short and it's uh, pretty well spoken. We often don't know how to recognize the things that are all around us all the time. Forces of power, political arrangements, economic norms, and I think that's something that art can help us do, is to teach us how to see. My name is Trevor Paglin, and I'm an artist. Limit telephotography is a technique to take photographs of things on the ground that are very, very far away. You use telescopes, you use tools that are designed for astronomy, and you apply them to terrestrial photography. This is a technique that I've used on a lot of different kinds of places, mostly places in the desert, mostly institutions having to do with the military, whether it's secret military bases or hidden infrastructures, infrastructures that are around us. Um, and they're very much a part of the fabric of the society, but are often shunted away and out of sight. There's a particular aesthetic that emerges when you're taking a picture of something that's so far away. So you're seeing images where there's heat and there's haze you're taking a picture of an infrastructure, but you're also taking a picture of atmospheric distortions, colors falling apart. So you get these very impressionistic kinds of images, and that kind of impressionism felt very vital to me in the sense of you're seeing something and not seeing it at the same time. And that, for me, was a really powerful metaphor. One project that I've been doing for many years now is looking at the sky, trying to track all the satellites and spacecraft that are above our heads literally every minute of every day, but that are unacknowledged. Satellites that are taking pictures of us, listening to cell phone calls or trying to examine the information flowing around the world. It's almost like a strange stepchild of astronomy. I've been working for many years on a project called Autonomy Cube, which is a project that imagines that we can use an anonymous internet, an internet that's truly like a library in the sense that you can look at anything that you want and the police don't get a record or the corporations don't get a record of all the books that you've checked out so imagining that kind of alternative infrastructure is important to me one of the things i'm thinking about a lot at the moment is the rise of machine vision artificial intelligence increasingly automated infrastructures and thinking about what the consequences of this are for the society and so I've been building tools that allow me to see the world through the eyes of automated vision systems, images and imaging systems that might be used in things like guided missiles or self-driving cars or you know, facial recognition software, or object recognition software. What drives me is a fundamental and deep curiosity about the world. And what I love about my job is that every day I get to get up and try to understand how things are working around me and to ask those kinds of questions on a daily basis and go as far into them as you can imagine going. All right, so um, just one more Trevor Paglin. Just, uh, this is actually um, just a quick image of a satellite that he created that has no purpose. It's just an art satellite. Oh. And then it burned out and uh, disposed of itself, unlike most of the trash, I believe, um, or most of the uh, satellites in the sky. But um, it has no surveillance purposes or function. Um, so, you know, that's kind of an artist's job is to ask, like, okay, this is cool. How can we make it art, right? Um, so kind of a funny project. But also um, he mentions the word the fabric of society. This is something that a lot of contemporary landscape artists think about what makes up society what's the, the fabric of society what are the materials that we use and that's something that we see mark bradford do really well this is our artist spotlight today um and he's kind of layering up landscapes that he's familiar with um in really interesting ways so we're just going to watch uh, a little uh, few minutes of a video from him as well and we might you might be able to see that these are kind of um landscapes you can't really they're abstracted, right? Um, maybe we can't quite tell what the material is yet, but you will find out. This one's actually a map here. Um, and we have like a kind of a rib, that black line going through, it's kind of like a river. Um, so just let's listen to Mark Bradford talk for a little bit because he is uh, 
He's another just big hitter right now. Ah, oh, I just replaced this. Okay, it's okay. We'll go to YouTube. Liberty, 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 liberty. Sorry, commercial. Who is that? I'm going to just pause that for a second, spared you the commercials and the intro. Um, I'm just going to watch a few minutes of this. I know it says 24 minutes, but uh, we're not going to go there. No. When I discover something new, it's like when a person buys a new pair of shoes, some people take them home. Some people, right in the store, they put them on. That's totally me. I want to put them on right now. Like, right now, I want to take the old ones and put them in a the box and take them home. That's how I am in the studio. <laughs> you're suddenly introduced to being a part of something bigger than yourself. That sense of the monumental, but also of our part within it. He really very fluidly uses found materials from within the world, and he uses those things to incorporate the social and political context directly into his work. It's kind of experiential, ambiguous, poetic, and honestly, always beautiful. Mark Bradford is an American artist from Los Angeles. Known for drawing on the urban environment, he uses what he finds around him as material for his multi-layered work. He's been chosen to represent the United States in the Venice Biennale, perhaps the biggest commission of any artist's career. Born in 1961, Mark spent much of his early years in the hair salon run by his mother in downtown Los Angeles. I got called a sissy a lot because I was kind of sensitive, creative, very much in touch with my emotions. I was kept safe. That's what I remember the most about before adolescence, this kind of safe space. Really safe. It was almost like a collective. So I really grew up in this matriarchal society that was pretty much self-sustaining, super, super powerful and they allowed me to be me. Mark's breakthrough paintings made a storm in the art world. True to his roots, he wove the social fabric of the hair salon into his art. You get out of school, you're working a trade, which is being a hairdresser. I want to make artwork, and I need material that's cheap. So necessity kind of makes invention. End papers, these small two-by-two two rectangles, that you use for doing perms for, for African-American people. You do jerry curls. <laughs> there were 50 cents a box. I can experiment. I can make mistakes. There's no way that I could do that with oil paint. He's speaking so very directly to black girls and black women. All of us knew what that was. We all know what it is. It was only later that I was able to make sense of those emotional impressions of this really beautiful, colorful, complicated, fragile painting. Here you have an inspired use of the grid. So it's really speaking directly to modernism. The hair papers themselves introduced this incredible other social and eventually political content into the work. I liked it because it came from the social fabric of life and it came from what I did for a job. Trying to bring the social back into the studio and then trying to bring the studio out into the social, it's like the back and forth thing. I often view it as, as code switching. You know, he's able to say like, you know, I got you girl. Like we're able to see something in the work, but there's also something there for an erudite art world audience. It's that layering. It's the fact that they both exist, but you wouldn't have one without the other. Being an abstract painter for me was a political act because I, I didn't want people to overdetermine what it meant to be at black what it meant to be gay, what it meant to be a studio in South Central, what it meant to grow up in San... I was like, whoa, like, I need to make this story. I don't need a revisionist story. I need to keep it complicated and messy and slow. Mark was in his early 20s when AIDS hit America. The disease affected the lives of thousands of young people in his city. The 80s. It was like a gone fishing sign when so many people are dying and dealing with the ideas of shame and guilt and the church and all at one time. And you are 18 or 19 years old. It's hard to process it. 
He invented this beautiful image of the United States, scraped back out of the wall. The statistics of AIDS infection available as of a couple years prior to the exhibition. It's just numbers on a page until you realize that those numbers are connected to people. It's like when we drop bombs. It's just a map and a little burst until they take pictures on the ground of the people and the homes that they've destroyed and the lives that they've destroyed. So you had this map that was made literally out of sanding back through the lobby wall so that all the previous projects that artists had done over the years on that wall kind of came through in their remnants as they had been painted over and then painted on and painted over and painted on. But he also began doing research looking at medical of AIDS, very close up microscopic images of blood, of different kinds of bodily fluids. And through those very abstract images, he found a way into a content that had to do with the body, that had to do with the body in crisis. I think I do want people to remember people that struggle, not just erase it. We, as a society, can do more to not turn our gaze if a person says that they're in need. All right, I'm uh, going to call it there, but I'm also going to let the video play out. If anyone's interested, you can keep watching. And I uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks. South Central LA is American artist Mark Bradford's home turf. His studio is based in an old warehouse where he makes paintings and sculptures to be shown all over the world. That one was the first one. I had never pulled off paper like that and it felt like hanging trees. Today he's working on a major new commission for the Herschel Museum in Washington DC. It's eight huge pieces that adapt imagery from a historic painting, the Gettysburg Cyclorama, which depicts a key battle in the American Civil War. The fabric of the country was being torn apart by two factions. This image imbued a lot of those thoughts of kind of tensions and histories laying on top of each other and policy and politics. And rope is basically what I draw with. It's my hand. I'm actually using the rope as a background, but this is where the rope was, so now that's a memory. So that's a memory of the rope, and the rope now is on the top. So this is just a trace of it. Even though I used the pickets charge from the Gettysburg Cyclorama, I, I sent it to a billboard company that does these huge big billboards and, and, and had them kind of use the dots, sculpture, the dots that you would use to do a billboard um, imagery. So it starts to fall apart, and I wanted it to look like billboard. You're never supposed to get this close to a billboard. So I like the idea that you can get this close and so you can see the pixels and the bad colors. And but then when you stand back, it actually acts like a billboard. I want this idea of an infinity too. That's why I use a very um, uh, uh, horizon line. I played with the horizon line and I made sure that all the lines were very, very horizontal. That, that it just almost like a cyclone, that it would twist and twist and twist. This is the battle scene. The cannon ball made this big smoke shape and I really liked it and so I pulled it off, but I left battle at the bottom. You can see the wheel. They become abstract paintings in the end, but the source material comes from something that is more politically and socially charged. And some of that urgency is still in it. It's not gonna, you can't rip it all out. I didn't want to rip all of it. Isn't that what we're always doing is we sort of taking the remnants of the good and the bad of our history, of our environment, and we're constantly trying to remake, rethink, pull apart, recompose. Um, isn't that what we have to do if we want a better world? Is that kind of continual work at it? Thinking and walking is something I've always done since I was about six. I, I think and walk. For me, I have to walk to think. Sometimes I'll walk the streets to think, or walk around the studio. 
I do 70, 30, or sometimes 60, 40, which means I, I work on projects that I'm, that are, I'm working on. And I understand that about 60% of the time, 40% of the time, I allow myself to just play in the unknown. As soon as I discover something new, oh my God, that opens up the next moves. What I've learned from one piece of work, I will immediately apply to the next one. That's me. Oh, and he discovered that and he applied it to the next one. But it's, like, it's not just from the streets and it's yes. not just from the studio. It's a hybrid. Bringing information from the world, bringing the social, political, psychological, whatever things I was interested in, using material from the world, bringing it into my studio, adding another kind of psychological and historical fabric on top of it and some all chemical thing happening and it's a it's an it's, it is a work mark grew up with a strong urge to make arts but for a long time was forced to find other outlets for his creativity mark paint this on the wall mark style my hair mark help me with my makeup mark do a little film creativity was something that was always part of my life but it didn't lead anywhere it was just something you experience after work my mother was an artist. She always had the creativity. She just never had the possibility. My mother grew up in segregated America. She became a hairstylist and she used all of her creativity for that. My grandmother was known for being able to sew and draw anything that she saw. My uncle uh, would make these comic books. So what I realized is that I was the first one that was able to go to art school and kind of formalize it. And I gave myself permission to follow my voice. And that's what my whole career has been. I still give myself permission and no compromise. I compromised before, you know, but not, not, not when I became an artist. No. In the spring of 1992, long-standing tensions between the Los Angeles Police Department and the local community boiled over into week-long rioting across the city. Mark started noticing physical traces this period of civil unrest left on the world around him. In 1992, I was still in school, so I really hadn't developed a material vocabulary. But after the riot, it physically changed the physicality of the urban environment. A lot of plywood barricades went up. You would start to paper the one sheets on them, and they would become very, very thick. You didn't have that many before. Cyclone fencing merchant posters. What the merchant posters would always point to was, again, urgent need. We know you're losing your house. We're going to give you five cents on the dollar. Oh, well. So walking by a sea of merchant posters, you immediately knew what was going on in the community. Bed bugs, immigration, losing your house. You would get this incredible snapshot. They're almost hidden in plain sight. They're part of the cityscape, but you wouldn't see them if you don't need them. So unless you do need phone minutes to call a loved one in prison, or you can't afford the Orkin man and you're looking for an exterminator. There was a kind of lack of money invested from the city back in rebuilding that neighborhood. So there were lots of posters about different kinds of economies in the neighborhood, different jobs, different businesses, many stories about a recovery that almost happened but never did in that neighborhood. So he would literally scavenge those posters and use a lot of the found text as a way, again, of embedding a political subtext in the work. There is a really very sophisticated interplay of how one material can suggest a whole network of people in a particular place at a particular time. And the interesting thing about merchant posters, the demographic was very small and the runs were very short and they were gone. And then I would, I, sometimes in, I started get, I would see a merchant poster and I would like it. And I thought, it's really cool. I'm gonna come back next week and gone. And all memory of what it was for and who bought into it, all gone. Los Angeles, it's all spread out, it's haphazard, there's no focal point, it has such a wonderful subtlety, and there are ways in and out of that aesthetic that are very different. Mark has won, he kind of gets that like a place like LA is not very old, but it has aspects of that, including peeling paper that gives you an emotional quality of something having taken place. History can be very long or it can be the matter of a few lives or a generation or a set of an events that has meaning. And so he's always playing with that idea of the patina of history even over a short period of time, not a European city that has centuries. 
After the riots, the social makeup of Mark's neighborhood changed as African Americans moved elsewhere and were replaced by an influx of Hispanic immigrants. The precarious lives of this fledgling community left traces on the walls and telegraph poles around, inspiring a huge work with a loaded title. Los Moscos translates to the flies, which is a derogatory term for migrant day workers, you know, people who might be by the side of the road waiting to get into the back of a pickup truck in order to go to uh, any number of jobs and be paid you know, off the grid. Latin American people had a very different relationship to public space. So you started seeing people more selling on the streets, food vendors. So public space again started to change. And that was really interesting to me too. Formally, the work is so astonishing because you have this kind of black field that's punctuated by these very vivid colors. And personally, and you know, I'm from LA, it always reminds me of what it's like, that kind of that sense of excitement and kind of that kind of sprawling beauty of landing at LAX at night. So there's both this sense of it really looking like a place, but also all of the ways that it evokes this whole other world. I do have this idea of being a witness a little bit and wanting to have memory that people lived here. For Mark, what he makes in the studio is only part of being an artist. He dedicates his time and resources into developing the arts and addressing social needs in his city. Ten years ago, he set up a foundation called Art and Practice to give back to the community he grew up in, Limert Park. What if little Mark had walked in to a space in his neighborhood on his way to the store for his mother, and he experienced contemporary ideas? Forget about the object, but contemporary ideas. It was a performance. It was a, a sculpture that didn't look like anything that he'd ever seen. The first time I went to Art and Practice, it really felt like something new was happening in the art world, a space where everyone was welcome, where the very idea of contemporary art being for everybody was being played out. Giving people access to contemporary art's one thing, but meeting people at their need, their personal kind of emotional, personal private need that has to do with something more urgent is kind of where art and practice sits at the crossroads of kind of access and need. Art and Practice provides support services to foster youth in South Los Angeles, as well as putting on free museum quality art exhibitions for the local community to enjoy. It is a epidemic of foster youth. Many young people hanging out in the, in the, in the park in front of the foundation, nowhere to go, timed out of the foster care system. Just, and I thought, well, that's what we should do. We should work with social service provider that deals with foster youth issues. What I find interesting is if you think about other models for this kind of community engagement in this country, are these extraordinary African-American men, I have to say, Rick Lowe in Houston, the Astor Gates in Chicago, who use their success in the market to then give back to their own is really exemplary. I see what it's doing. I see the change that it's making, and it's exciting. <laughs> The ERA. The Venice Biennale is the biggest and the most prestigious event in the art world. Exhibitions, installations, and national pavilions spill out of palazzos, squares, and churches across the city. Black, gay, and liberal, Mark Bradford has been chosen to represent the USA. Being African American, there's oftentimes this idea that I'm supposed to represent, and I've always pushed back against that. I'm like, I'm not. Rep how can I represent a whole race of people? That's ridiculous. So for me, how can I represent a whole country? That's ridiculous. But what I can do is I can make a body of work that has and holds the ideas that are particular to me. More often than not, uh, the American artists who were chose to do the Venice Biennale are struck first by the Americanness of the architecture of that pavilion. This very symmetrical Jeffersonian architecture. It feels like the White House the first time you visit it. You're on the good behavior, you walk around and say, oh, this is where you're going to show, and this is what, and it feels like a UNESCO site. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be interesting to kind of pollute it a little bit? Like, 
the White House after the apocalypse. He's called his exhibition, Tomorrow is Another Day, bringing together sweeping canvases, brooding sculptures, and a film. Together, they cast a critical eye over structures of class, race, and gender that underpin American society today. So when you enter through the side, which is very important, I never felt walking through the front door would ever work. I don't think that strong ideas ever go through the front door anyway. The whole process was really bodily. You come to spoiled foot. This bulbous mass, you see the ceiling that has collapsed. And you really have to hug the edges of the room. The center is not yours to be able to access. People are always doing this passive looking. It's always horizontal and they're just doing this with their head. Standing in the center and I thought, I really want to play with the physicality of the person's body. And so I created a space that feels tight and that you can't get into the center. The center is not there. There's no longer the center of the room. I want to collapse and make a sculpture that infests the center. Really about innards. And the next sculpture in the second room is really like vomiting up. It's like vomiting up the innards. It looks like entrails. It looks like guts. I think he wanted the discomfort that emanates from the world today to breathe out of the pavilion. I kind of wanted to make it feel like a ruin because whatever America will be moving forward, it is not what it was. So this idea of that whatever we were, <clears throat> that's gone. And one of the things about Mark Bradford is that he can tear apart an entire construct of like freedom government history and he can do it in a way that's still sensuous and beautiful. The final word in Mark's exhibition isn't a painting, but a film called Niagara that he made in 2005. It depicts his former neighbor, Melvin, walking away from the camera. Mark has again chosen to put black identity center stage, striding confidently into the future. To give Melvin that last word, when this is your triumphant moment, I think speaks again to that generosity that's always there in the work. The vulnerability of that body, the street is hot, and so the, the kind of heat waves come up and distort his body in various ways. But I think to bring that, which is an older work, to bring that back at this moment was a way of speaking to a kind of vulnerability of a particular um, identity in this culture at this moment. So it speaks to the long arc of American history and what it means to be an American, and at the same time, um, be unflinching in one's criticality. That's about a hard won hope. Hard won and a little rough around the edges, but still hopeful with his vulnerabilities and his strengths. This is the this type of hope I like the most. In some way, he's an artist that's eternally optimistic. The thing about Mark's work is that it is opinionated, but it's also never without hope. I think that working at it of the surface is, for me, that sense that there's a, you know, that's all there is to do is keep working at it. I need to make the world understand that this is what an artist looks like, that we can be at the table alongside the politician, the preacher, all the other people that they allow at the table for some reason that they don't think that we need to be at the table, which I never understand. When did we lose our passport? <laughs> You make the space. And I think that people who were not allowed or people who were uncomfortable taking up space were the main ones that should take up space. I think that people who lived on the margins and people who don't feel like they should to take up space are the main ones should take up space. Diego, my right hand on Excuse me, would you mind if, if history moved forward? No, force, aggressive, you, sit, you demand. Thank <laughs> you.